Good evening, everyone. It is certainly a pleasure and an honor to be able to present this to you tonight. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that um, you have been a big help when it comes to this mission work. I know that there were some individual members that have contributed to this particular work. I, I believe that the congregation contributed some as well. So this is a report on where your contributions have been going and, and what kind of work it has been doing. So you, I don't feel like I really need an introduction because I'm here as often as I am. Uh, so I'll just get right into the mission work. So this particular trip, and we take a trip every year, this is a mission work that the Dalrada Church of Christ, my home congregation, has been working on for, I want to say, about two decades now. I don't think it's quite 20 years, but it is close. And they have been working on this in this region for a while. The Church of Christ has been working in Ukraine on the uh, eastern half of Ukraine for a while, the part is th that is closest to Russia. However, when Dalreda took this over, this was a brand new mission work because it was the first time the Churches of Christ had reached out to the western half of Ukraine. So you see there up on the map that this is a map of Ukraine. And the area that we were in, you can see that red circle right there, Ivano Frankis. So we are very, very far in the western part of Ukraine. Uh, it's a part that, like I said, it's relatively new. The Church of Christ has, has not had a lot of work in there. The only Church of Christ that is established right now are two congregations that we have helped set up in the ivano Frankis region. And uh, it will help to understand a little bit of the cultural differences here, so I'm going to go a little bit into that just so you have some proper context. I'm sure that most of you are aware that back in 2012, hostilities began escal escalating between Russia and Ukraine. And that was largely due to the annexation of Crimea. And uh, Russia has for a long time now sought the reestablishment of the USSR, trying to reclaim those territories that they had back when they were the Soviet Union. And Ukraine was sort of the crown jewel of the USSR. And because of that, Russia has been trying to retake this particular part of the world. And it's amazing to me because this is something that you don't see a lot in the headlines. And remember, my other job is I'm a news guy. So you would think that if this was being reported on, that I would see it quite a bit. But the news has been largely silent on the things that are going on in the Ukraine. And uh, with Russia and the conflict between these two nations, there is a war going on right now. And there are casualties every single day. We got to meet with some of the military over there that actually have been out there on the front lines. This is something that is an ongoing conflict. It's not quite as big. It's not what you would call a, uh, an open war in the most traditional sense. There's not like giant trenches like you would imagine in World War I. But there are people dying on a daily basis. And because of that, this is sort of the environment that we find ourselves in when we go in and speak to the people in Ukraine, and they have friends and relatives engaged in this conflict. This conflict has torn families apart. There are certain people in the Ukraine that are very sympathetic to Russia's cause, and because of that, some families find some of their family members on opposite sides of this. So it's not as though this is some kind of war zone that we're going into. I don't want to give the wrong imp impression to you. Uh, when we've gone over there, we've never felt anything but safe. And it's not as though there's, you know, battles going on around us or anything like that. That's happening primarily in the eastern half of Ukraine on the other side of the country from where we are. But it is something that affects the mission work and affects the people that we speak to. And where I'd like to start off this morning is the purpose of the mission. And if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 26, verses 28 through 29. And to understand this passage, I'm sure it's one that the vast majority of us are actually already familiar with it is when Paul is imprisoned and talking to King Agrippa and he does what every good Christian should do in a situation which is find opportunities to spread the gospel to those that have not heard it. And so instead of defending himself and trying to get himself out of his bondage, he takes this as an opportunity to preach the gospel to others. And in verse 28, this is King Agrippa's response to Paul's message. Agrippa replied to Paul, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or a long time, not only you, 
but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. This is at the core of every single thing that we do. Because ultimately, should this not be the attitude that we as Christian people adopt, whether in the mission field or right here at home, that the people that we're preaching to, the people that we're telling about the story of Jesus, that there is a way to find salvation, that there is a way to get off planet Earth alive, that there is a way to live a better life, we have this desire inside of us to say to others around us, there is a better way to live. We want you to live the way that we're living, not because we're trying to grow our numbers, not because we want more people in the club of the church, that's not what it is, because we want you to have the peace that passes all understanding, we want you to have the mind of Christ in you, which is what Christians are called to have. We want you to live the best life possible, and that is why we want you to become a Christian. That was what Paul wanted for Agrippa. He wanted, because he saw, other than the fact that he was in bondage at the time, that the life of a Christian is a rewarding one, a good one, a peaceful one. And it is the only way to live a life, because it was the way that we were intended to live, to be conformed to the image of his Son, and to live the way that God designed us to be. Paul understood that. And because Paul understood that, he wanted to preach to everybody that he met that this was the better way to live. That's exactly what we're trying to do in Ukraine. We go to these people not as uh, people that are from a, a richer country and telling them that this is the way you should design your political system. We're not coming to them saying, well, we're, we're so much better educated than you, we're smarter than you, and so we're trying. No, it, it's a very humble thing. We come to them and saying, there is a better way to live, and we want you to live the same life that we do. We want you to have that spiritual life that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. So this is the region, this is part of the Ivana Frankis region. This is a small mountain village called Zelena. Now, we sent, I believe, four teams out to different parts of the city, different parts of the region here in Ukraine. This is the village that I spent the vast majority of my time in, and just like the apostles, we followed the biblical example. We go two at a time. They send us out in groups of two, and I was with my partner, Brother Doug. You'll see him in a few of these pictures in a second. But the reason that I show this to you is it's to give you an idea of the kind of remoteness of the village that we're going to. So in Zelena, it took us from Ivano Frankis about two-ish hours to be able to get to these places. And uh, you don't have to, if you're a roller coaster junkie, you don't have to go to an amusement park to get a very similar ride because driving through these mountain roads that were kind of thrown together, uh, you're going to get quite a bit of excitement on that trip. So it's very rugged terrain, it's a very remote location, but these are people that are excited to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because of that, that is why we go. Uh, to, again, to kind of illustrate the remoteness of where we are, you can see there, and I know it's very difficult to see on these, these screens, but uh, these are two bridges in the village that we went to. Uh, the longer one over there on your left, that is a rope bridge that spans a chasm, and uh, you, you, have to be, you have to have pretty good balance to get across it, I'm not going to lie. The other one doesn't even have a rail, it's literally a log they set across a creek. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's very rustic, very remote, but the people there make it work. And because of that, we, we go and we get to kind of live like them for a little bit for a week. And, and because we're there, we're with them, we're, we're doing the same kinds of things that they're doing, that helps us get a better feel of how to relate to these people. Uh, this is a wooden stove inside one of the houses that we visited. Yes, you heard me right, a wooden stove. Because up in the mountains, they have electricity, but it pretty frequently goes out. And because of that, they have wooden stoves in all of their houses to keep themselves warm if it goes out in a long winter because, and I say this just, I want to say two weeks ago, I got an update from one of my friends in Ivano Franquise that said that they had had five feet of snow on the ground up in the mountains. So because of that, the, the, weather, the electricity goes out quite a bit. In fact, it went out for one of the days that we were there and the school cooks everything in their cafeteria on a wooden stove because if they had an electric one, there would be some days where the kids just didn't get to eat. And so, as a matter of convenience, they actually use the wooden stove because it's more reliable. 
this is what we are working against. Because in Ukraine, the state religion, and yes, they do have a state religion, there is an official church of the nation of Ukraine, is the Orthodox Ukrainian Church. And they are very well established, and they are in bed with the government. You'll see this building. You might think that this is in the, the middle of a big city or something like that. No, this cathedral is in the middle of nowhere. There's hardly any people around it. This is not far from the mountain village that we were staying at. But you'll notice, despite the fact that it's kind of out in the middle of nowhere, very ornate, giant gold domes over the top of it. The reason for that is because in Ukraine, the official Orthodox Church takes money from the people in the form of taxes, not contributions. They take it from them as a matter of law, and their government funds the church. And that is both bad and good, and here's what I mean by that when it comes to spreading our message. The Ukrainian people are naturally skeptical of religion and naturally skeptical of the church because they have lived in an environment where the church takes advantage of them. Back when Ukraine was a part of the USSR, most of these churches were burned down. And when they were no longer a part of the USSR, what happened is the church had to rebuild all of these locations, and they did so on the back of the taxpayers, on the backs of the poor. They are accustomed to a religion that exploits its own people. And because of that, there are some people that it's very difficult to share the gospel with because they have a bad taste in their mouth. That they believe that all Christians are like that. That this is something that is part and parcel of being a follower of Christ. And yet, it also creates opportunities. Because for all the people that you have that don't want to hear anything you have to say because they believe all Christians are like this, that they're coming to you wanting to exploit you or wanting something out of you, there are also people that because of that they see that that is not the true church. Building giant ornate buildings was not what Jesus Christ came here to do. And I think that we can all understand that. And when they have people come to them with food and medical supplies and donations, we've helped build hospitals over there. We have helped uh, retrofit different clinics that they have, small clinics out in the towns where they're, they don't have enough money for a hospital. Uh, we've helped nursing homes. We've helped uh, one facility that's for special needs individuals. And so when they see the church coming here wanting to do good for them, wanting to help them out, they have a very different idea of what the church was always intended to do, and that opens doors for us. So yes, in some ways, because of the culture and because of the climate that we are dealing with, it does create some difficulties. Religious persecution is still a thing that happens in Ukraine. In fact, the preacher's family over there, Ivan, uh, his wife and daughter had to flee the country. And they had to live in New York for a little while because there were people in the government there in Ukraine that didn't like the fact that they were converting people. And because of that, they trumped up a charge on them uh, saying that they had stolen a cell phone. I won't get into all the details of it, but they basically made up a charge and tried to go after them. And the only thing that their lawyer could do to keep them from going to prison, and believe me, you do not want to go to prison in Ukraine, especially if you're a female because terrible things can happen to you. Uh, because of that, they had to flee the country. The preacher's family has had their father dragged out and beaten in the streets because of what he is teaching. There is real religious persecution going on in Ukraine right now. But because of that, there are some people that see that and understand that that is not the true church. And they have a thirst for learning about the real church, the church that Jesus Christ built, and that is where we come in. This is a mountain cabin uh, in the village of Zelina, and it was construction on it began before the war had started. And the two brothers that were working on it, one was on the Ukrainian side, one was on the Russian side. So when I said it tore apart families, I meant that very literally. And one went off to help on the Russian side, and the brother that was on the Ukrainian side was not able to finish it. And so the village up there is actually thinking about purchasing this and making it into a church building, that would be something that's a little further down the line because we're still trying to establish a congregation there. But they went up and showed this to us, and so there are opportunities that are created 
And I, I have to believe that some of these buildings and some of the doors that we've seen open over there have to be at least in some part God's providence trying to help us out. Now, whether or not we eventually wind up purchasing this building to use as a church or not, I don't know. But it seems as though there were an awful lot of doors opening for us and opportunities being presented to us that would not have been otherwise. Uh, this is just the inside of that building. You'll see the gentleman in the middle there sitting on the pile of wood. That's Brother Doug. He's the one that actually went with me. And uh, he was one of the, the brothers that helped me uh, preach to some of the people there in Zelena. Uh, this, is the, this is our whole group. We went up to Zelena. The first day all of us went to Zelena before we actually got involved in the mission work. And uh, the people in Ukraine, very hospitable. They invited us into our, our home. And uh, you see in the middle there all the food on the table. That was course one. They tried to kill us with food. I'm convinced of this. Uh, they had all kinds of different food, Vereniki. Um, they, had, they have these giant spits where they'll put pork on and just grill it out. And it, it's a man's paradise because all the food is very like meaty and, and hearty. So uh, we had a really good time and the family invited us into our home. And uh, it's making these little headways into this that help us get involved with the community. And it was very lucky that one of the families had connection to the preacher there in Ivano Franquis, and because of that, that kind of helped roll out the welcome mat for us. And they invited us into their home, and this gazebo that you're seeing in, we had two four-hour Bible studies apiece with this family. And so, very interested, very curious, very much excited to hear the gospel. And they made it a point and a priority because how many American families do we know that are willing to have a four-hour Bible study over the course of two days? There are some, but there's not a lot. And because of that, there is this thirst in Ukraine that we hope to make good use of and hopefully try to spread the word of Christ. This is um, that same family, though, uh, you'll see there on my left, that's Brother Doug, the one that I went uh, with, but everybody else is a member of the family there in Ukraine. That's Galena, and she's a uh, very important person in her community, well-known, well-established. Her family uh, helps out with a lot of the, the events that are going on in the community. They help out with the school. Uh, all of the children there are uh, involved in the school, and the, uh, I do actually have some sad news. The little girl there in the front, she actually passed away recently. She's been sickly. Uh, for a long time, and unfortunately, they, they prayed and prayed and prayed, and, and she's had lung problems, but uh, eventually she was, uh, her little body just couldn't stand the strain anymore, so unfortunately, she has passed on, but we got news that even though he's not in this picture, Galena's father, who was one of the ones that we had these four-hour studies with, uh, which, by the way, four hours was probably about, I would say, three hours worth of material because translation does take some time. Uh, but we, we did have these studies, and he actually obeyed the gospel. And if you remember the last time I was up here about a month ago, that was the morning that he had been baptized, and I announced it from the pulpit here. So there is uh, results happening from this mission work, and he's somebody that has been very important in this community. He's kind of seen as an elder of the community, and because of that, it, he was really the first one. It's very likely that the rest of his family will soon be baptized. We've already studied with them. They've already expressed interest in it. And so we're, we're trying to, or we're hoping that soon that they will obey the gospel as well. And once that happens, it'll be a lot easier for us to go into the village and, and preach more to some of the other people as well. Uh, this is the school there in the village of Zelena. And that's a picture of me and Doug and some of the other students there. Now, we do a lot of school visits. And one of the reasons that during the day we visit with the schools is because they're always excited because so many of their school children are learning English. Well, they jump at the opportunity to get, some, get a few native English speakers in the classroom to actually have conversations with their children. And surprisingly enough, especially if you get into some of the more advanced English classes, they speak English extremely well. And I'm talking little bitty people that can have a full conversation with you in English. And so they love it. It's an opportunity for them to get to hear a native English speaker. But the reason that this is important to the mission work is because we have conversations and have a good time with them. And then we pass out material to them that talks about the gospel. 
We invite them to Bible studies that we have at night. So we go to the schools in the day, invite them to our Bible studies at night. And then for the ones that come at the Bible studies at night, we talk to them about the gospel. And if you can get the kids involved, just like Vacation Bible School here is here at home, you can usually get the parents involved as well. So this is something that has been a very fruitful work, and, and this is the model that we've been following for the past 15 years. And it has resulted in two congregations being established, and it looks like we're going to have a third before the end of the year, hopefully. Uh, this is at a school festival they did. There's not a real great way to explain because, you know, cultural differences and holidays. Uh, this is kind of like Veterans Day for them. So they have a holiday that they celebrate there in Ukraine where they celebrate the people that fought in the war against Russia. And we got to participate in this. They brought us in and, and got us to help out with the festivities there. And the best part of this is they allowed us to be judges. And there were different contests. They had singing contests. They had uh, a relay race and all this stuff. But the most important thing you need to know is there was also a cooking contest. And we got to be the judges of that. And you're always scared what the food's going to be like when you go out in the mission field. You never know exactly what to expect. I got to tell you, I miss Ukrainian food every day. Uh, they have this thing, one of my favorites, called banosh. And they actually served us two different kinds of banosh in this cooking contest. It's basically really rich, buttery grits that have a lot of bacon grease poured in it and bacon on top. So really good eating in Ukraine. Uh, I was not upset at having to judge that cooking contest. But anyway, so they do this, and it's a good way for the church to kind of say to them, look, we're people just like you. Uh, we like to uh, get out and have fun, but ultimately we are here to preach the gospel of Christ. And, and once we have sort of break, broken the ice with events like this, it makes people far more receptive to hear what we have to say. It's kind of like that old saying that we hear about preaching the gospel all the time. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's doing stuff like this that helps them establish that relationship to where they can trust us and they're more willing to listen to us when it comes to our preachings of the gospel. These are some of the events at the school. You can see they're, they're cooking bereniki, which is a local dish over there in the bottom left. Uh, that's a relay race on the top left. They had an apple eating contest. They couldn't use their hands. Uh, that was real fun. And uh, they had different events and different awards. And so what we did for this is we actually presented them with the prizes. And we donated the prizes, which they only have one soccer ball for the whole school. And so the winning class in each category got a soccer ball for their class to use. So now they have three or four of them that they can use. They're not worn out. They're brand new. We got good quality. And again, this is something that opens doors and opens opportunities for us. To illustrate this, the principal of this school was very skeptical of us when we first showed up. We were friends with Galena, the lady I showed you earlier. And she has a, a very good reputation in this particular community. And her good friend is the vice principal of this school. So it was really operating on her good word and her friend, who was the vice principal, that they allowed us to do this. But the principal, very cold, didn't want to talk to us, was, I, I don't know, he kind of felt like he was suspicious that we were going to do something wrong. I, I don't really know how to describe it. By the end of these three days, we had a conversation with him. And we don't lie about it. We, we were very upfront. He said, so what is it that you were hoping to accomplish because when you came here and we said, all we're here to do is to talk about the, Jesus, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell people about the Bible. And he looked us in the eye very warmly, shook our hand, said, you are welcome back here at any time you want. It's things like this that make a difference in the community that show them that we do care about them, that we want to be involved in their lives. We're not just here to boost our numbers or anything like that. It really is about creating a relationship between us and them, and more importantly, between them and Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a, another school that we visited. Uh, this is an English class that we were able to help out with their lessons. That's me and uh, Doug and Nastya up there in the front. Nastya is one of our translators. Uh, she's uh, very, very good, and that's another thing. One of the things that we have to pay for, one of the things that is an expense for us, is we have to pay for translators because no matter how zealous and willing we are to preach the gospel, it does very little good if you don't speak the language. And a lot of the younger people speak pretty good English. 
but especially when you're reaching their parents, the older people, that's not really the case. And so we have to have really good translators, and, and Nastia is a real pro. She's a college student studying English. She actually just recently graduated. Uh, there's several others that we've paid. And here's another thing about this. Uh, we have four translators. One of them is the preacher's daughter, who basically taught herself English, very smart girl, and her three friends from college, who are not members of the church. But since they came on these trips with us and they had to translate our Bible lessons for us, they started asking questions. They started getting interested about this. So it has a dual purpose. Of course, we have to have the translators or none of this works. But it also functions to get them interested in the church. And because of that, there, have been, uh, there were a couple of the girls that actually had a Bible study over Skype after we got home because they were that interested in it. They made time in their week to have some of these conversations with a couple of the guys that went on the mission trip with us. So this is creating opportunities with them as well. And it's interesting because in some ways it's very difficult to teach the gospel in Ukraine because of some of the things that I mentioned at the beginning of my lesson, some of the issues that come up with cultural barriers and the government being against us and that kind of thing, in some ways it's actually easier. Because you'll see up here on this board, John 3.16, and I wrote that, which is why it's very difficult to read. Uh, John 3.16, which I wrote up there to help teach the kids English in school. So we can't come out and actually talk to them about baptism or the plan of salvation or any of that stuff in the school. But we can teach the Bible. And we can't establish that we know something about this, that this is the reason that we're here. And they're fine with us telling them that we're missionaries and we're here to talk to people about the Bible. And it's interesting because if you broke this up on the board in most of your public schools in America, they'd flip out on you. But in Ukraine, they don't have a problem with it. And so this is one of the ways that we really start building that that first uh, relationship with the children, and that, of course, leads into some of the other things I've talked about tonight, that when we start talking about the Bible, and, and they are fine with us talking about the Bible in those classes, uh, that really makes a difference to them, and it establishes that relationship between us and them, and helps teach them a little English along the way. This is actually a special class that Julia, who is another one of the members there in Ivano Franquis at, at that congregation, uh, she actually teaches a special class where she helps instruct them in English. And it starts out as an English lesson. And the parents and, and students already know this going into it. But she concludes it with teaching them the Bible. She'll have them read in English out of the Bible. Uh, I think the lesson that we did this particular day, I was sitting in this class, was Noah's Ark. And so Julia is a member of the church. And, and that's another thing, too. We're not just teaching the Ukrainians, and then helping them become members of the church. Of course, we're doing that as well. But we're also teaching the Ukrainians how to grow their own congregation. This isn't a situation where we come there to grow their church. We establish the church there, and they start growing on their own. Since I've been back in America, we've had no less than, I want to say, seven or eight baptisms. At least those are the ones that I can remember. We've had Bogdan, uh, who's the, the gentleman I told you about, the older gentleman, uh, we had uh, two just last week, and we actually had one today. So this is a continuing work. This is a congregation that knows how to evangelize, that we help them evangelize. One of the things that we did on this past trip is we taught them about church finances. And this church operates largely on their own. We help them a little bit financially, but as far as the day-to-day -day, uh, paying the rent for the building that they're using, that kind of thing, they do that by themselves. We help them with humanitarian stuff, but they're a, uh, more or less a self-sustaining church right now, and they're looking into, right this moment, selecting elders. And so this is a, uh, a work that we're really teaching them how to, how to handle the church business themselves. Now, this is a picture that was taken of the church building that they are constructing right now. Uh, this was taken back when I was over there, and you'll see that they don't have the roof on yet, and that this was taken back in October. This is going to be the congregation there in the city of Lissette's, which is going to be the new home of the Ivano Franquis congregation. It's kind of halfway between those two cities, so they can just meet in the middle there. And then, of course, there's the other congregation over in the, the other side of Lissette's that we looked at a building for as well. 
Uh, but this is the building, and, and the thing that I didn't actually know about it until the most recent time that we went there is that they had expanded the project, and now this is not only going to be a worship building, it is also going to be the first Ukrainian school of preaching. So they have rooms in here, they have living quarters, restrooms, showers, all of that, for students to come and live and to learn how to preach the gospel to others here in Ukraine. We're very, very excited about this. Uh, this is just the inside. You can see that the roof isn't quite finished yet. Um, these are some of the bricks that they make. And, and one of the things that uh, I really love about these people, being a fiscal conservative myself, uh, they're really good at budget. They try to do everything that they can in-house. They make the bricks themselves. Uh, most of the construction is done by members of the church to keep the cost down. And so they're very, very efficient with the funds that they are given to build this building. This is actually a storage unit that is just outside the church building. And if you look down there on the bottom, it was really funny because these were materials that I had packed myself over here in America to send over to Ukraine. And so it was really weird that I packed all the stuff up and sent it over and then I get over there and I was like, wait a second, I remember packing that. So it was kind of an odd feeling, but this is where it goes. And the reason they have the storage building is, so if people come up to the church building with some kind of need, whether they need glasses, crutches, some kind of medical supply, which is not nearly as abundant over there as it is here, they're able to help these people out immediately. And because of that, because they have these uh, storage units there, they can do help on a, a broad scale as well. And this, again, helps create that relationship between people in the community and the church itself. This is the food cellar that they have underneath the building, and this is, of course, to store food. They can prepare food there at the building, and so it really is almost like a boarding school kind of feeling for the people that are there at the, uh, the school of preaching. And it also allows them to store food for a long period of time that they can share with the community for those that are in need of it. Uh, this is one of the rooms that they're going to be using for the students at the school of preaching. They already have a couple that have, have signed up and said once the building is finished, they want to be some of the first students there to learn how to preach the gospel to others. This is one of their workrooms, again, where I said they, they try to do everything that they can in-house. This is one of the ones that they use to actually make their own bricks. And another thing that's really interesting about this is they make their own bricks, and then they also make bricks for other people as well. And so it's a project that they can use to raise money to then turn back around and use for the church. Uh, this is back in Zelina that I mentioned, and the members of the church there are loading up a truck for lumber to use on the roof that you just saw. So they even get their own wood, they cut it down themselves, they refine it themselves. It's all done in-house, it's very efficient. Uh, we actually got to go down there and help them with some of the construction. Now, uh, I was fortunate enough to not be around when they were doing that, but several of the men that were with us, we were actually doing a Bible lesson when they were doing this. But they actually went down there and helped put up part of the roof. And this is a picture that was taken about a week and a half ago. They finally did get the roof put up and they finished the roof and luckily right before the big blizzard hit. So that was very fortunate. Uh, so it is well underway. They've gotten it to where it's, it's mostly functional. They've got a couple of windows they still have to put in. The exterior doors are supposed to go up, I believe next week, but this is a project that is continuing to improve. And this all brings me back to this final point that I want to leave you with. If you look at John 17, this is a prayer from Christ to God about what His church is going to look like, how it's going to operate, the kinds of people that are going to be in it. This is a prayer for His disciples that He gives in John 17, 22 through 23. And here Jesus says, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. This is what needs to be at the core of everything that we do, not only in the mission field, but as a church in general. That just as Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one, this is the kind of perfection and unity that Jesus is talking about when He wants that for His disciples. We should be united with each other and ultimately united with God as well. And this is the reason that we go to people in the Ukraine saying, you can have this kind of unity too. 
We want to be united with you, and we want you to be united with our Father. And just like, regardless of cultural barriers, language barriers, none of that stuff matters over there. Ultimately, it goes back to, are you willing to live the life that Jesus Christ asked you to live? And that's the message that we bring to them every day. And you'll notice that at the end of this, where he talks about being perfected in unity, he gives an indication of how other people in the world are going to know that we are the followers of Christ. So that the world may know that you sent me. So ultimately, the way that we have unity with our brothers and sisters is how the world is going to know, yeah, they're the people that follow Jesus. They're the ones that follow His teachings. And so, it's imperative that we do this, isn't it? That we go to other countries, that we meet other people, and we say, we want to be united with you in purpose, in cause. We want to be your brothers and sisters in Christ. We want that for you, and, and we want to have that kind of fellowship with you for our benefit as well. That's the kind of unity that Jesus Christ was talking about, and this is really what we're striving for. This is, again, in front of the uh, big cabin that we were looking at from Zelina. If you look at that picture, there's Ukrainians and Americans mixed in there, talking, laughing, having fellowship one with another. We had a fellowship meal earlier today. I know that you all remember it. It's really no different over there. I mean, you have to have a translator to speak to some of them. That's true. But other than that, that kind of unity, that spirit of oneness with the church, it's just as present there as it is here. And because of that, that's really what we're striving for is to go out and make disciples to help them to understand that they can have the same thing that we have, the same blessings in Christ that we have. That is why we go over there. And so... Ultimately, what I'm asking you to do is to remember this, that regardless of where the gospel is preached, there is good soil. There is fruit that can be grown here, and the cause of Christ can be furthered no matter where you are. Now, it is possible that this evening, that you are not a part of that, that you do not have that perfect unity that Jesus wanted for His disciples. And whether that's because you have yet to obey the gospel, or it's because you've fallen away, that you've been caught up in something that you're having a hard time with, and that unity that you used to have isn't quite there. If there's anything that we can do to help you out with that, please let us know that now while we stand and sing. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives so, I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So, give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.